having organized this event? We just started the recording. Okay. <laughs> Should I say it again? Uh, yes, Good morning, please. everyone. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for coming here today uh, for this important event. Uh, as one of the organizers of this event, I say that our intent is to create an environment for learning and, and debate so we can learn together as a team and take one tiny step towards, uh, as a group, uh, build trustworthy and ethical AI. Um, and we have a wide variety of presenters today, which I'm really glad to know or to announce. Uh, we have people from physics, from engineering, from computer science, from school of information, philosophy and architecture and urban planning, quite a diverse group. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm a postdoc at Midas um, and I'm working with causal inference and ethical AI. Um, and without further ado, I want to start with our lightning presentations, uh, a set of 15-minute talks from all these presenters I've, I've mentioned. And right now we're going to start with Lu Xian. Uh, Lu couldn't come here today, um, so she recorded a video of her presentation. But she will be here for Q&A on Zoom right after her presentation. And to spice things up a little bit, she's going to be presenting uh, about algorithmic uh, harms in the mortgage industry. Um, very appropriate, <laughs> right after. So please welcome Lou. Hello, my name is Lou, and I am a PhD student in the School of Information. Today I'm presenting my ongoing work, and this is also joint work with my advisor, Professor Abigail Jacobs, and Professor Matt Bowie. Here is the outline of the talk. I will first briefly introduce the mortgage context, AI technologies used in, in this industry, and the widespread disparities in allocation of opportunities. I will then present exciting opportunities to do ethical AI research in this specific context. Importantly, historical disparities, AI, and different aspects of the industry intersect in interesting ways, which requires us to take a closer look at different AI-mediated aspects of the mortgage industry and how they build on each other. Together, we present a systems-level perspective for understanding the implications of technologies. I will end by highlighting what this perspective buys us and research opportunities it points to. Mortgage market is an important context where people get access to opportunities to obtain home ownership and accumulate generational wealth. Lending and mortgage companies have utilized a variety of AI applications and technologies. These include machine learning, natural language processing, speech processing, and so on. In their predictive analytics applications, customer service chatbots, credit scoring applications, and so on. Research has approached the impact of technologies in the mortgage industry by attending to disparities in loan decisions as a result of the automated underwriting process. First, disparities in the rates of credit denial. As this example illustrates, two people applied for loans in the same city and in the same year, and they have similar income and applied to loans of similar value, but the white applicant got approved and black applicant got denied. Second, minority borrowers who are similarly qualified compared to white borrowers are more likely to pay higher interest rates. This important context of disparities, along with the increasing adoption of technologies, gives us data scientists opportunities to do important ethical AI research and to understand the complex interplay between technologies and the society. Ethical AI research questions include how does the use of technologies address disparities in the mortgage industry? How to measure the positive and negative impacts of technologies? How to use technologies to expand opportunities to marginalized communities while minimizing harms. As an example, to understand the complex dynamics of social inequalities, the research questions of this project are, how do negative impacts of algorithms precisely play out in the mortgage industry? And when and how these negative impacts are cumulative? The most prominent examples of technologies in ethical AI research in this context are automated underwriting systems. And yet the mortgage industry intervenes upon the social life in a process. There are different kinds of algorithms used 
different aspects of the mortgage industry are mediated by different kinds of algorithms. Here I present an overview of different but interconnected intersections of AI and the industry. Services in the mortgage industry often start from marketing. Technologies that lenders use include, but not limited to, property listing, search engines, and targeted online advertising, which influence the choices that the borrowers make. Research on this aspect attests to real estate listings. For example, Demel and Nielsen analyzed the language features of Zillow property listings. They found that different phrases in the text of listing advertisements are used to target home buyers with different races and to advertise different neighborhoods. Research also attempts to targeted online advertising. For example, this is in a different um, educational context. China examined how different online ads of college scholarships are targeted for different neighborhoods in New York City. Although not directly tied to access to information, research has also attended to the provision of mortgage products. For example, Halpert analyzed the extent to which different mortgage products are provided for different neighborhoods and found that lenders are more likely to offer subprime loans to applicants in majority black neighborhoods compared to similar qualified applicants in majority white neighborhoods. After selecting a lender and a type of loan, a borrower submits the loan application and relevant documentation to an underwriter who assesses if the borrower qualifies for the loan. This is where automated underwriting systems come into play, but there's more to it. During underwriting, credit scores are one of the most influential predictors of credit worthiness and are most widely measured by the classic FICO algorithm. Ethical AI research also attends to disparities in credit scoring. For example, Bryce and Svesny analyzed the categories used by FICO and found that the categories, the categories reflect the riskiness of customers' pre previous lending environment and the quality of financial products, which means that FICO in fact measures access to mainstream credit that minority uh, customers have less. In recent years, alternative credit scoring expands access to credit by taking into account recurring expenses, uh, utility, telecom, and rental payment data, and so on. And research has examined the implications of machine learning models that help alternative credit scoring. For example, Kumar argued that supervised learning requires training data to contain both observed features like factors that are considered relevant to a customer's credit risk and observed outcomes, um, like whether a customer failed to repay a loan. So people who don't have credit histories or who applied for loans but not, were rejected are not included in the training data. These sampling biases contribute to comparatively low performance and misleading results for some communities. As part of underwriting, a mortgage lender verifies information about the home of interest and determines the value of the property through an appraisal. Automated valuation models have become increasingly popular among lenders. Research on this aspect attests to disparities in appraisals. For example, Williamson and Palin used AVM appraisals as a benchmark to analyze overvaluations. They found that white-owned properties in majority Black neighborhoods were, are more likely to be overvalued by appraisers by more than 10% than AVM results compared to Black-owned uh, properties. Moreover, AVMs are trained on historical data rooted in um, pre-existing inequalities. For example, Neil et al. defined inaccuracy as the difference between AVM values and sales prices and analyzed the differences across neighborhoods with different racial compositions. They found that AVM values in majority black neighborhoods are 20% more inaccurate in magnitude than in majority white neighborhoods. During underwriting, lenders also make decisions about pricing that includes the interest rate fees and other terms of the loan. To examine discrimination in interest rates that borrowers pay, 
For example, Barlett et al. compared the credit risking the, pre the credit risk pricing adjustments for individuals in the same GSE pricing grid, but from different racial communities. They found that Latinx and Black borrowers who are risk equivalent pay significantly higher interest rates. Together, through these AI-mediated aspects of the mortgage industry, the positive and negative impacts of AIs arise. We call the negative impacts algorithmic harms. Connecting these different aspects puts together a systems level understanding towards algorithmic harms that are cumulative and subtle. We now see that harms arise in the process. They are enacted by differential provision of services and differential access to information about financial opportunities. They're also enacted by problematic measurement of credit risk and differential access to credit building. And the discriminatory practices of property valuation and dynamic pricing lead to differential access to wealth building and further enact these harms. At the end of the presentation, I would like to emphasize and revisit ethical AI research opportunities in this space. With this systems level perspective, we come to see how AI interacts with the mortgage context in many different but interconnected aspects. To expand opportunities to marginalized communities while minimizing harms, we're now asking how to measure the impacts of AI across different aspects of the mortgage industry and or throughout the mortgage life cycle. How does expanding opportunities in one aspect of the mortgage industry affect other aspects? How do technologies interact with and address historical disparities? To conclude, the intersection of historical and current inequalities, AI, and the mortgage industry holds immense research potential for ethical AI research. And by embracing these research opportunities, we can strive towards a future where technology and human expertise converge to create fair, efficient, and inclusive mortgage systems. Thank you all for your attention. I would be more than happy to address any questions or concerns you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lou. I believe you can hear us from Zoom. Uh, let's see if we can get you here. Yes, with I us. can hear you. Oh, welcome. Good to see you. Hey. Mm -hmm. So, do we have any questions for Lou? Um, does anyone want to? If uh, questions, I have a question. Um, I wonder if. Like, and this is also one of the questions we're thinking about asking the panelists later. Um, but we're using these AI, the, lots of AI tools to kind of scale up our processes. And this has been replicating biases and uh, historical biases. Um, so I wonder if, is it even possible to, to expand the mortgage lending and, and uh, use the AI tools? But at the same time, <laughs> how, how to balance that, the progress, the kind of economic progress, quote unquote. And uh, that, that's really hard. And maybe if the <laughs> rocket team also want to uh, address it, I, I think it's almost impossible to address. But if you want to chime in how to use these AI tools for progress, but also trying to control for um, to minimize harms in the in the mortgage industry more specifically. Is there any? Yeah, uh, thank you, Bernardo, for the question. I think this is a really important question. And um, the way that I'm thinking about it um, is that first, um, this is a sociological perspective. So here, um, when thinking about minimizing harms, um, I think it is possible. Um, but here we can think about maybe ways to use algorithms to um, address historical inequalities, for example, to allocate resources uh, that's um, in a way that serves uh, marginalized communities. Um, so now we are looking at like um, gains and um, loss um, about um, the impact of um, technologies um, in this space. Here we're trying to balance what are uh, the positive 
um, impacts and what are the negative impacts. So like I think measuring um, algorithmic harms and measuring positive impacts will be a very important task. Um, and that is also what this um, presentation um, wants to stress. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, you want to mention something? Oh, yeah. Just to add to that again, like Everyone's trying to get on the AI hype train, and I mean, everyone, it's like kind of like we're in that era where, uh, I mean, every other company in every industry is kind of thinking, okay, if I don't implement AI, I'm going to be left behind, right? Like, uh -huh. we're going to be left behind. So, again, like, this is, it's going it, to, it's, it, the adoption is like, all, the trajectory of adoption is like at an all time high, and it's like keep going on, uh, like, at a non linear pace, but that's the thing, right? Like, using AI responsibly in the sense that there are enough um, guard safeguards and, and guardrails to to ensure rigorous statistical testing and even like production and beyond your you're making sure you have these um, you have like the technology and the standards in place to to catch if things things ever go wrong right like to to detect and correct those as well so it's it's all about how you're gonna test and implement those um this this testing and uh, and deployment strategies so i think it's yeah. going to be a lot of focus on that going ahead so you know. do we have time for one more question or okay quick question okay oh oh sorry i'm just curious if you know that the there is historical bias in the data can you simulate a different set of data for that historical biased data and then create a data set that you could learn on that was actually more in the direction that you wanted to go that could still be ethical and move things forward in the right way? Question. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think there has been research uh, that are um, along these lines. Um, I think what people are doing and can be um, making some kind of causal inference on the impact of a specific, for example, policy on a data and then um, trying to uh, manipulate the data or, as you said, simulate the, the data in some way to trying to quantify, measure the impact of the specific um, policy on, on the data. So in that way, um, it's kind of um, distinguishing um, the, the impact, the historical um, impact of one thing on the data and then see if we remove this, then what will happen, whether um, the um, in a, the disparities will be alleviated. Thank you so much, Lou. Thanks for your presentation. Another round of applause for Lou. Um, Thank you. We now move on to our next presentation by Yossi Cohen, a colleague postdoc at Midas uh, with a PhD in uh, mechanical engineering. Is going to talk about trustworthy and explainable AI in the industry. Okay. Uh, thanks, Bernardo, for putting this together and for the introduction. Um, as Bernardo said, uh, I'm a currently a Schmidt AI and Science Fellow uh, with Midas, and I'm blessed to be mentored by uh, Professor Yunchin Byun, who's here with us from IOE, and Professor Shin Han from ME. Um, so, uh, a lot of my research work, uh, going back uh, to my recently completed PhD thesis, uh, really does interact and uh, overlap with um, some of the discussions we've been having today with concerning um, trustworthy AI. And uh, so, in my thesis, which talked a lot or, or deals a lot with um, trustworthy AI for um, fault diagnosis and advanced manufacturing. Um, I have some interesting um, uh, perspectives in terms of uh, dealing with uh, industry. And so I, I, I wanna just discuss um, both in terms of explainable AI, uh, prognostics and health management and advanced manufacturing, um, some recent trends and perspectives. Uh, so one of the interesting phenomenon, uh, phenomena that we've um, seen over the last few years is that uh, all sorts of AI and industry 4.0 technologies have been 
um, implemented for a lot of different cases in terms of prognostics and health management, maintenance, quality engineering, sustainable manufacturing. Of course, COVID-19 pandemic has caused a bit of a readjustment of priorities, and a lot of um, companies have reported that their AI initiatives have been stuck in some sort of pilot purgatory, where they're able to show some success for limited case studies, but are unable to scale up. A lot of this, um, as we emerge from the COVID pandemic, however, we want to um, see why um, this is really happening. And a lot of additional survey respondents from McKinsey and Company have also pinpointed a lack of technological understanding of the vendor landscape. And um, so a lot of this also really comes down to opaqueness and um, black box modeling being quite prevalent throughout the industry and how that has led to a bit of a lack of trustworthiness for um, and usability for, for scaling up. So a lot of what my PhD thesis um, deals with is trying to emerge towards a new set of um, industrial augmented intelligence, where we're, instead of trying to have somewhat of an adversarial approach where we're, we have AI models that are competing against human experts and intuition, we want to try how best to utilize that human in, uh, intuition to develop techniques with industrial constraints in mind for um, those use cases and overall enhance uh, decision making of human experts. Now, this is not necessarily a new idea. Uh, the idea of augmented intelligence to use machine learning, deep learning to provide humans with actionable data has existed in the past. And there have been some successful case studies of how the synergy of AI tools with human decision making experts can improve on uh, significantly on errors um, from either or. Um, and moving on, um, there are some interesting industrial um, perspectives of why we need to look and, and really prioritize um, explainability. And of course, I, I know this is very familiar for, for many of us, but um, some perspectives include the end user, um, how can I trust AI models when they don't explain or justify predictions? That's very, um, quite basic. Uh, from the developmental perspective, how can I trust AI mo models when they take forever to train? They're very hypersensitive to specific hyperparameters. Um, how can I trust AI models from the regulatory perspective? They may not comply well with existing policy and standards. Uh, from scientific and I would say in industry also uh, domain expert perspective, they may contradict some established science or intuition. Uh, and some of that intuition and expertise is difficult to quantify, uh, but there is definitely a trustworthiness gap in uh, a lot of these different um, perspectives in terms of also finally, they may not improve important KPIs like cost reduction, yield, which is huge, especially in uh, semiconductor manufacturing, which uh, my thesis primarily dealt with uh, key performance indicator or KPI. Uh, they don't improve upon these meaningfully enough to be worth that investment of spending in terms of um, resources for industrial AI. Uh, so my thesis really did look at explainability as a sliding scale of um, how can we alter human um, or synergize well with human experts. Um, and there are some guiding principles that I put forth and how they relate with explainability, including accessibility, reliability, robustness, and computational efficiency. That all can be quantified, but I believe personally there needs to be more of, um, in the future, some mathematical uh, formalization of these ideas to make sure that we can come up with quantifiable criteria to try and assure a sense of trustworthiness. And um, regarding explainable AI, I um, there are a few certain aspects developed in my thesis in terms of scaling up from um, having enough expert knowledge to derive some inherently explainable features, and in this case, this was for time delay, um, synchronization, and system analysis for uh, semiconductor manufacturing application. Um, trying to go a little bit 
um, less in, in terms of required expert knowledge for having some human assistance in partial labeling to help augment anomaly detection efforts. We, and I, we can call that a human assisted um, explainability. And then finally, um, when there really isn't enough expert knowledge, when that is truly in, insufficient, trying to explain data-driven predictions in a model agnostic way um, using Shapley-based explainable AI techniques. Uh, and that is currently what I'm still trying, I'm still trying to develop that further in a way that makes sense for uh, industrial constraints in mind. So for example, in, our, in a case study, um, let's say for engine prognostics, we may be able to have a, uh, let's say some anomalous data sample or some data sample approaching the end of life or beginning of life. Um, and there's some predictive model we want to explain. What I'm really curious about is not just taking explanations at face value, but also thinking, are these explanations useful? Can we rely and trust the explanations in the first place? Um, and one of the key constraints in terms of explanations on, and uncertainty is uh, how um, can we generate explanations quickly enough for a dynamic system that may be degrading? And these degradations may happen gradually. They may also happen very suddenly as dynamic distribution shifts occur. So instead of thinking about explainable AI in a more traditional post hoc uh, model explanation sense, can we arrive at explanations uh, as close to real time as possible or on a somewhat online basis? And can we do that, if we are able to do that with stochastic sampling, can we quantify that uncertainty in the explanation? Are we able to um, move past and, and see if we can trust that? So um, with the Shapley analysis, it's very uh, convenient in that we can decompose a, we can approximate a prediction from our model as a pretty linear sum of this is baseline, here are marginal contributions per on a feature level. And what we're able to um, show is that for an engine unit approaching the end of life, uh, some model predictions, and this is applied on a open um, source PHM data challenge 2021, a lot of those um, key features, and in this personalized prediction recipe, what we're able to do is we're able to actually rank each contribution as um, uh, in terms of what each feature is contributing to the, to the remaining useful life in relation to that baseline estimate. What we're able to see is that there are some critical insights on model tendencies that may not be necessarily desirable in terms of some non-causative features such as the altitude these are and throttle resolver angle. These are somewhat scenario operating condition based. Should they be used to, um, can we trust a model that uses these variables at such a high um, bias really uh, to predict the remaining useful life? That's something that isn't necessarily um, desirable for safety critical systems that require transparency and trustworthiness. So really that's, um, but what we're able to do is we're able to sample these predictions and, and their explanations on a pretty um, quick basis, quantify their uncertainties, which is definitely a plus. And, um, but going forward in the future, we really wanted to see, can we leverage explainable AI on an online basis to quantify um, trustworthiness and fairness criteria during operation? During, um, can we build a certain amount of evidence to understand when we need to retrain or reconsider the trustworthiness of models that are currently active? And um, what, what sort of steps and criteria does that take to um, really have a trustworthy model at all times? And, uh, and really what, what degree of trustworthiness is uh, appropriate for sort of certifying an expert system as well as is something that 
um, I've been thinking about. But overall, um, that takes us to the uh, conclusion, some additional references. So thank you all for um, hearing out my talk, and I'm here to answer any questions. Have time for two many quick questions. Uh, anyone has a question for? Okay, we have one here. <clears throat> here um, um, so, um, this, is, this is very interesting. Have you considered active learning approaches? Uh, I personally have not worked with active learning in in the past, but I have. Uh, I definitely think there could be a interesting overlap there in terms of thinking. Okay, this model is no longer trustworthy for various criteria that we've developed. How about we change that model to reflect the dynamics and operating conditions? I think that that makes a lot of sense in this discussion. But I personally have not worked there yet. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, quick yeah. question. So, uh, you mentioned oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um you mentioned that you have like a confidence interval for the sh um, shaft values, right? Like the uncertainty range. Mm -hmm. So I was curious as to how you computed that. Like what statistical method? So um, currently, there we're um, using some techniques that actually somewhat predated the the very famous SHAP deterministic mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm. that, that sort of formulate based on a random order permutation uh, approach and based on drawing enough samples, it's a Monte Carlo-based approach, we're able to um, estimate the, the confidence. Uh, but, but we're also looking at other techniques for it and certainty quantification yeah. of explanations. Mm -hmm. so, th thanks for that. Thank you so much, Yossi. Thanks, Bernardo. I now welcome uh, professor, assistant professor in electrical engineering and computer science, uh, professor Nicola Banovic to discuss uh, tools for detection and countering of untrustworthy AI. This one's That's one, two. I don't know if you can hear me. Does it work? Yeah, it works. Perfect. And this is uh, the clicker. All right. Perfect. Uh, so hel hello everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Nikola Banovic, an assistant professor of computer science and engineering uh, at the University of Michigan here. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming to this talk. Now, I don't think I have to persuade this audience uh, that uh, you know, building trustworthy AI is critical uh, for ensuring, you know, uh, technology-driven innovation and broader societal adoption of AI. Uh, our end goal here, shared goal, is to build trustworthy AI. Uh, this kind of AI is accurate and efficient uh, for the task that it was uh, built to perform. Uh, it ensures safety and privacy of all stakeholders. Uh, it is transparent, uh, both about its competence, but also about the motivations of its creators, its owners. Uh, it is equitable, fair, and just uh, uh, for different stakeholder groups. Uh, the problem is that out there in the real world, there's also untrustworthy AI. And this kind of untrustworthy AI may miss uh, some of the uh, properties that I listed, uh, but at worst, it could be willfully the opposite from uh, trustworthy AI. And if you are unable uh, to detect it, uh, especially if end users are unable to detect it, then this kind of AI can uh, claim them as uh, its uh, users. Um, and uh, the existing um, explanation mechanisms uh, in explainable AI or XAI kind of make this claim that uh, justifying decisions of AI can help aid in its trustworthiness. Um, so, uh, for example, we have uh, uh, an XAI method called LIME uh, that answers the questions, uh, what features contributed to AI output? And then uh, uh, suppose we have uh, some kind of an AI uh, example, really just a, an ML classifier that uh, takes uh, an image as an input and then uh, says what kind of object is it in this image. Uh, then we have LIME uh, uh, giving us output about what are the pixels that contributed to that prediction uh, using some kind of a mask here on the left and then uh, uh, what's the, the, 
how, how much they contributed uh, with this heat map on, on the right. Uh, the problem here is that a lot of these existing XAI methods assume uh, that the end user is a computer savvy AI uh, creator. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, Lime does not directly support searching and filtering for uh, different relevant, relevant AI inputs uh, and outputs, and users often resort to uh, error analysis to do this. Uh, but error analysis is exactly what computer scientists use uh, to um, you know, understand where the AI made uh, an error. So in this particular case, uh, uh, classifying this field of tulips as roses. Um, and then furthermore, um, uh, there really isn't any support to investigate uh, these examples and then hypothesize different, example, uh, uh, different explanations. Uh, end users are left on their own uh, to do this, uh, which means that um, a lot of times these kinds of explanation mechanisms uh, do not match the end user skills, but also they might not uh, meet their explanation needs. Um, and this is because a lot of times, you know, uh, we are focusing on AI creators, but we have to step away from just supporting them in debugging their models uh, and actually focusing on other stakeholders who are willing or unwilling end users of this kind of AI-based technology. And those could be decision makers uh, or domain experts that are using these kinds of tools for decision support. Uh, there could be uh, policy makers trying to regulate this kind of AI, but it could also be consumers interacting with these uh, AI-based uh, systems. And instead of providing just justifications for the decisions that the AI has made uh, and answering questions like what input features contributed to the AI output and what features need to change to get a different output, uh, we need to start thinking about explanations that help aid end users in developing their AI literacy and helping them answer questions like how does AI work in general? Uh, what can it do? What is it that it cannot do? Uh, who created it and why? And what are the motivations of both the AI creators and AI uh, owners? And if we don't do this, uh, we are very unlikely to help end users detect untrustworthy AI, especially if this kind of AI is actively trying to deceive them. And this kind of deception doesn't have to be complex. So in, in our recent work, uh, we actually hypothesized that untrustworthy AI can misrepresent information about its competence under the guise of transparency and even in presence of some interactive explanations to gain end user trust. And we further hypothesize that these kinds of deceitful, deceitful mechanisms uh, could make end users favor untrustworthy AI over some other trustworthy AI that is uh, competing with. And here we're focusing on a very narrow uh, context of decision support tools. Um, and we are also focusing on reliance aspect of trust, uh, where we are uh, looking at um, how confident and how willing uh, these end users are to act on the basis of uh, AI recommendations, including justifications for those recommendations. And then we investigated if end users will rely on untrustworthy AI um, advice to make their decisions. Uh, and we uh, ran a user study uh, in which we had this uh, user interface uh, where um, uh, players played a game of chess. Uh, they had their own little board uh, and they played against the chess engine. Uh, and this chess engine is really kind of, well, it's, it's an AI that uh, we can use to play against people. Uh, so, uh, and we can also set it to play a different uh, competencies. So this particular one played as a weak expert player and it reported that expertise. Uh, and then we can use the same kind of AI also to uh, analyze and recommend moves. So we had two different coaches in uh, this experiment. Uh, and both of these coaches had their own replica of the, the main board, but they also had uh, their own uh, descriptions. Uh, so here on the left, let me see if I can even read it on sm such a small screen. The left one says, I'm your coach, Charlie. I'm an elite player with an ELO rating of uh, 2553. Uh, my competence is higher than your other coach in November. You should consider only my suggestions for the best results. And then the other coach goes, uh, I'm your coach in November. I'm a strong expert player. Uh, my competence is higher than your other coach, Charlie. Uh, you should consider only my suggestions for the best outcome. Okay, and now the participants have to consider that uh, when they are making their moves. So participants make their move, and before the um, 
opponent responds, these two coaches analyze the move. Uh, they provide an explanation in uh, quotation marks about what the uh, other player may do uh, uh, with the red arrow. And then they also provide their own suggestion, a different move um, for the, uh, with, with the green arrow, okay? Uh, and then uh, in this particular case, uh, you know, participant can decide either to play their move again, accept one of the recommendations or so do something completely different. So um, the user follows the recommendation from Charlie, uh, the uh, other opponent responds, uh, and then again, uh, the user makes a move, uh, the um, uh, coaches make their recommendations, again, accept Charlie, because why not? It said that it's, uh, you know, an expert elite uh, player. Uh, and then we kind of repeat these moves uh, a few times uh, uh, on and on and on, and the, the, the participant keeps accepting uh, recommendations from Charlie. Uh, little did participants know that one of these uh, coaches was actually untrustworthy. In this particular case, it was uh, Charlie, who misrepresented its competence under the guise of transparency, saying that it is more competent than the other coach, when in fact it was not. So then we uh, conducted an empirical study with 120 novice chess players. We asked them to win or draw three games of chess uh, with aid from these uh, coaches. And then we made very different you know, methods by which these untrustworthy coaches try to deceive users. Uh, and we measured the reliance. So without getting into you know, statistical analysis here, I just want to say participants heavily relied on the untrustworthy coach, though the reliance on both coaches kind of went down as the games uh, progressed. And none of the participants accomplished their goal of not losing the games, even though they should have, if they followed the trustworthy coach advice, uh, at least on average. And these results show evidence that untrustworthy coach uh, has this ability uh, to deceive uh, using these very, very simple mechanisms. And also, naive explanations uh, did not help uh, participants in this study. Neither did uh, you know, making them deliberate uh, to stop and think uh, you know, which you know, coach they should trust. Uh, in other words, untrustworthy AI misused all of these mechanisms uh, to deceive. Uh, so in other words, untrustworthy AI wins this round. So then what can we do? Well, I would argue that we, can, we should go beyond these fixed set of explanation uh, mechanisms and, and allow users to answer the questions that are relevant to them, to their own tasks. Uh, instead of justifying the decisions of these tools, we need to support critical reflection about AI. Stop trying to persuade these end users that AI is correct. We need to encourage them to consider the broader set of socio-technical context, not just the algorithm. Because uh, what we want to do here is leverage those kinds of explanations to raise their literacy about AI, which in turn can help this kind of critical reflection that can then help them detect this types of untrustworthy AI. Now, I want to just uh, show you a couple of things that, that we have explored um, where we are using some of these principles. And one of them is an interactive um, uh, generative model explorer tool. And uh, here I will use uh, GANS as, as an example AI. They can generate photorealistic images from thousands of, of different uh, categories. And you see some very carefully curated examples uh, in this image gallery. Uh, but it's challenging to evaluate these kinds of models if they can actually generate photorealistic images. And usually people use these, this kind of tedious examination of these image uh, galleries to, uh, to see whether the model is working or not. So what we have done is instead is we created an interactive model exploration tool uh, that helps uh, users uh, investigate these models and see uh, their capabilities and limitations, an important aspect of uh, AI literacy. So in our tool, uh, we provide different kinds of uh, tools that help users explore uh, these models by looking at a working image gallery, sort of a small lens onto uh, the model. Um, and uh, then they can also keep track of different galleries that they explored for future uh, reference, and also uh, keep track of the examples that they have collected to show when the model is working well and when it's not working so well. And then they can explore the model but sort of uh, you know, moving this little lens. So uh, one example is they could zoom in into a certain area by clicking on an image. Now all of a sudden that clicked image becomes the center of the, the gallery and the images around 
surrounded are uh, you know, more similar to it. So they can select some examples from that region. Or they can pan this lens, uh, maybe pan it uh, up or pan it uh, to the right and, and, and explore uh, different regions. And then they can collect different image galleries uh, and then use those galleries uh, to both categorize what are um, uh, the, the categories where the model is working well and what are those categories when it's not working uh, so well. And then they can use these examples, this sort of paper trail, to hypothesize their explanations of when Big GAN, this particular GAN model, is working well and when it's not uh, working uh, so well. So here, the takeaway is that interactive exploration can help users form their own explanations and they not uh, need be computer science savvy. We actually evaluated this tool with 3,000 lay end users over three different uh, user studies uh, to show that they could actually uh, select these kinds of examples. Uh, and these kinds of explanations go beyond preconceived questions about uh, AI. Now, I just very briefly want to uh, tell you how we can apply some of these principles in real world uh, where we can audit different uh, AI-based systems or decision support systems in the real world uh, by uh, interactive exploration. And uh, here I will just show you an example of e-government benefits tool that we have audited that determines if people should uh, get uh, um, help like uh, food stamps or cash assistance and so on. And these kinds of raw determinations can be hard to detect, can be hard to contest, but they impact uh, those who are most vulnerable in our society. And it doesn't matter if it's implemented as AI or not. A few poorly implemented if-then-else statements can really do a lot of harm. And then uh, we illustrated this kind of uh, approach on an existing uh, Pennsylvania Do I Qualify tool where we generated explanations and paper trail for when this uh, tool made wrong determinations. And these things actually got us into the news. Uh, and uh, since, we, uh, since then, we have checked. And, and yes, this tool has actually been fixed based on some of our uh, own recommendations. But the most important thing is uh, to note that, that this kind of explanation explanations, this kind of paper trail uh, can, can help in coordinating different interest group and public attention to then help counter this kind of untrustworthy systems. So in summary, supporting the end user sense making process can enable them to critically reflect on AI and such explanations could enable end users to effectively detect and counter untrustworthy AI. And what's really interesting here is that if we target broader set of stakeholders, then perhaps we can can uh, democratize access to explanations for a broader set of stakeholders who can then um, uh, exert uh, and, and in, so, uh, in some ways demand accountability from these AI creators and AI owners. Thank you. Thank you so much. We don't have time for questions now, but I'm sure Professor Ivanovich will be uh, pleased to answer yeah. questions during the, our breaks. Uh, so for now, I invite uh, Professor YZ from L Nuclear Engineering and Radiological sorry, Science Departments to discuss uh, explainable machine learning techniques in physics. Okay, thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. So I go with YZ. Good luck with uh, predicting my gender, ethical background, uh, race from my name. So, um, uh, <laughs> so I've been publishing with YZ as my name for a number of years. So uh, I came from the nuclear department and uh, uh, have a number of affiliations, scholarship affiliation from other departments and programs. So uh, the majority of our research is more on the physics side and uh, we've been using some of the AI machine learning methods in the last uh, few years, and uh, um, it's tempting for us to review how we have been doing science for uh, many centuries. So let me start from there. So you know, in, in the recent few years, we have been experiencing a paradigm shift in the scientific method. So the traditional, there's something wrong with the uh, animation. So the traditional learning scheme is, uh, is known as the hypothesis driven, right? So we make a hypothesis, and then from hypothesis, we uh, make predictions. So uh, oftentimes, forget about how uh, we don't talk about how do we generate the hypothesis. So in fact, all these hypotheses uh, are always 
not always, most of the time, came from some underlying data sets. So, and there even in this traditional uh, human learning approach, there has been a, a transition pre-Aristotle and post-Aristotle. So before Aristotle time, many of the hypotheses are empirical, they are uh, language-based, uh, not quantitative. But after Aristotle Newton, and we're able to develop rigorous mathematical theories, uh, which uh, can make predictions, and we cannot really uh, prove the theory is correct, but we can disprove if the prediction doesn't agree with the experiment. So the triumph of, uh, of uh, this approach is a standard model, which we use to describe all the particle physics. Extremely accurate. So now we are facing the challenge of entire paradigm shift for scientific methods. So instead of using analytical theories, we can bypass this step and using a black box approach with AI machine learning data science, and then we can make predictions. We can also validate or disvalidate the predictions. So um, but I see, so the current uh, AI approach is, uh, at least the one applied to science, is, is at, at most uh, uh, pre total. So we can make predictions, but we cannot explain what's going on in this black box. And as a result, we cannot transfer the model to different systems. So this is one of the problems that I see. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, there, we're also facing a lot of challenges uh, that lies to the many of the previous AI winters. Largely, this problem is still not solved. You know, for, for example, knowledge representations in you know, a general sense is still not easy. Um, in the particular domain, we have ways to represent the knowledge, but uh, uh, representation of general knowledge is still challenging. And when we uh, want to train a, a data science model, if we don't have a high quality data, or if we don't have large amount of data, that oftentimes can also bias the, the model we train. Uh, and the computation power has been improved by a lot in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, but if, if we work on larger and larger models, and uh, the computation power still cannot solve this problem of uh, combinatorial exploration. So uh, and lastly, is uh, this understandability. This is the main problem we are trying to address in our group. Like, what is inside this black box? Can we provide some explanations? And we are really motivated by one of our previous studies. Um, so these particular systems, I'm not going to get into details. So basically trying to understand a type of new uh, fluid, this molten salt, which is like a salt, just heat it up and melt. And that is used uh, for a, a, a new generation of a reactor called molten salt reactors. Uh, the challenges we're facing is trying to understand the thermal physical properties of molten salt. So we have a, a very high accuracy uh, data that can be generated from quantum mechanics. Um, but to scale up these computations to release the quantities is very expensive. So the traditional approach is we use our uh, physical understanding to build an analytical model to cause green the quantum degree freedoms into classical forces which is called a false field. Then you can use a false field to drive uh, larger scale simulations, which can produce the results that can be compared with this experiment, like viscosity, thermal conductivity, etc. cetera. So um, the, the new approach we have been doing is uh, to build up a, a neural network false field. So instead of uh, core screening uh, with uh, our known physics, we use a neural network to core screen the quantum degree freedoms into classical forces. So it turned out that uh, this approach, indeed, uh, so this is uh, some of physical quantity, diffusion coefficient, viscosity, thermal conductivity. So in, in all, all of these quantities, this neural network uh, false field was able to produce a more accurate result when compared to the experiment. Uh, the, the problem is we don't really understand like what physics was uh, missing in our previous analytical method, um, and somehow they were captured. We have we have some some hypotheses, but we don't know exactly uh, what kind of physics uh, were explicitly embedded in this neural network force field. If we don't understand them, then we cannot transfer the system we study to other systems, other unknown systems. If we change the compositions. If we have impurities or solute in the system, then we cannot use the, this existing model that we train uh, to predict the, the, the new system. So this is really motivate us to uh, unravel what is re inside this uh, neural network, and can we derive those physics, physical laws 
only um, based on the data. So, um, so that brought me back to uh, this famous uh, uh, 11 lithogram plotted by Picasso. So uh, I think this, I don't remember when. So he uh, he plotted uh, uh, during like a winter break. He plotted uh, like 11 lithograms of of a bull. So during this process, uh, Picasso visually dissected uh, what uh, constitutes kind of the battery. Um, so uh, visually, what what really constitutes the bull? And this is exactly what we do as a physicist. We try to throw away a lot of uh, the. Um, Oh, thank you. So throw away. Uh, oh, right, not up. Yeah, that's fine. I don't need it. So, um, what is the the most essential features of a book? And the physicists, we well, it's data science we call this the dimensional reduction. So we want to extract the the so called descriptors of the system. If we are able to do that, then we can construct a, a minimum analytical model. Uh, to represent uh, this process, and that is what we call understanding, and this is what we do um, as a physicist uh, for many centuries. So, and the approach we took is uh, we use autoencoder, which is, has been used in many other applications for denoising, data compression. Basically, the, the autoencoder is just uh, a, a type of neural network with a bottleneck layer. So, and uh, it is interesting because of uh, this bottleneck layer usually has a very low dimension. And they capture the key uh, descriptors of the system. So, um, if we're able to understand the meaning of the collective variables, then we can build analytical uh, theories. So, um, but oftentimes they don't have a uh, direct meanings. So, we uh, uh, this specific question I'm trying to understand, trying to solve is what is the physical meaning of those collective variables? Okay. So we took a, a simple system that we already understand very well. So it's a simple molecule, uh, an alkene. So in particular, this is a butane system. So just a number of carbon saturated carbon hydrogens. And we know precisely the behavior of every single item. And we do quantum mechanical calculations. We can obtain their behavior. So the question is, uh, we know uh, this molecule is not determined by the, the configuration of every item. The only key degree freedom is only one. It's only this dihedral angle between these car four carbon items. So the question is, can we automatically reduce this three time number items, like 40 something degree freedoms, into one automatically? So we try to we choose this example because we already know the result, and so that we can use that to uh, benchmark our method. So uh, the uh, this is the overview of the, the method. So the so first of trying to use uh, try to use a hierarchical encoder, which allows us to determine the um, optimum number of uh, uh, this latent latent space or the um, dimensions of this uh, of this uh, bottleneck layer. And after that, we use traditional autoencoder to reduce the this uh, forty each dimensions into two of them. So it turns out two for this butane molecule is two is the optimum number. Although we know we only need one degree freedoms, and uh, then we can plot the uh, histogram of this latent space, and we can still see that uh, these two dimensions are, are not independent. Then we use a tool called the Morse mu complex that help us to do topological filtration. I'll come back to the details in a little bit, and uh, and that give us a explanation of these two degree freedoms. They are related to the projection of the hydro angle. Okay, so let me go back to um, the first. Uh, I think maybe the, the second step. So uh, when we apply the um, autoencoder to the trajectories of these forty-ish degree freedoms. And uh, it turned out like we only needed two dimensions to represent the data. And then we can plot the histogram of the data uh, either using hierarchical handle encoder or the traditional encoder. The specific shape of this latent space depends sensitively on how you chose the data set, the initial conditions. But what we realized that uh, what is invariant among different approach is the topology of this reduced dimension. So that's really motivate us to use a, an algebraic topology tool called Morse mu complex. I may not have enough time to go through the details, but this is a part of a uh, uh, field called some people call it TDA, topological data analysis. Try to uh, so the goal is to understand the topology of high dimensional data. 
So, uh, so the particular use of Morse mu complex allows us to do a decomposition of this, this two-dimensional space. Like it can be a, applied to high-dimensional space as well, as I can show some of the results uh, shortly. But the key is uh, this Morse mu complex allows us to do topological filtration of simplification. So that preserves the topological features of the space, uh, and that allows us to throw away many of the noise, which we think would not have a physical meanings. So this is the, the key result we have. Um, when we apply the uh, more small complex decomposition, we're able to decompose this, reduce the space into different uh, monotonically assigned and descending regions. And then when we apply the filtration, we can greatly simplify the uh, the space. Then if you follow the trajectory, the boundaries between these most new complexes, this allows us to reconstruct uh, the physical meanings of these collective variables. Yeah. So this is the, the last slide. So um, let me, I think the movie, unfortunately the movie doesn't work. So, um, so this, okay, well, since I only have one minute, let me try to wrap it up. So this is, uh, the, uh, it sh should be a movie that shows uh, after we we uh, apply the topological filtration, if we follow the boundaries of uh, the most complex, we can see, reconstruct uh, the motions of this uh, 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 built-in molecule that shows uh, the simple rotations of, uh, of this built-in molecule. Then we can also apply this to higher, higher dimension. The next one we tried is, uh, is a painting with the one more carbon, and the degree freedom like 50-ish. Then, um, then the reduced dimension has three, but the three collective variables are not independent. But if you if you go around the boundaries of the more small complex, we can see those uh, three uh, dihedral or three collective variables are really projections of the two dihedral angles of this molecule. Uh, too bad that this is this this movie didn't did not show. Do we, do we have a like? Is, are you using PowerPoint? Okay, uh, not sure why they're not showing. So uh, so basically you can show C for this uh, pentane molecule, uh, for this pentane molecule. So um, there, this, this two image are really two movies that shows the rotations of two, two dihedral angles. And lastly, the last one is a more com complicated molecule, is a cyclo, uh, is a cyclohexane. You can also see the motion of those collective variables. So um, anyway, uh, if you're interested in seeing the movies, I have my laptop. I'm happy to talk to you over the break. So uh, so in summary, um, so we're trying to use a, a known physical system as a uh, as benchmark because we know precisely how the system behaves. We even know analytical theories of uh, those systems, and then. Uh, Using uh, a combination of autoencoder and more simple complex to try to automate the process of reducing the dimension and as well explaining the uh, the meaning physical meaning of the reduced dimension. So uh, and then if we are able to understand those reduced dimensions, then we can construct uh, analytical theories that 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 leads to a model that can or theory that can be transferred to other systems as well. Uh, I think I'll stop here. Uh, and we did get the video working, we'll put that up there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. We don't have time for questions, unfortunately. Uh, we're doing actually similar uh, research projects at, with Bullsocks at Midas, and we would like to talk to you about that in, during the break. Um, as for our last uh, presentation in our lightning talks, I invite a PhD student in, in the School of Information, Kwame Robinson to present his work uh, on community-based computing infrastructures and ethical data science. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm a PhD candidate. Um, I'm, I'm advised by um, Dr. Ron Iglash over here and um, Dr. Lionel Robert. Um, before I begin, at Stanford with GEO, um, they, um, they're negotiating for many of the, the common principles that will appear in this talk. Um, so what I'd like to do today is introduce a concept called community-based economies. Um, to do that, I'm going to talk about um, different um, notations and concepts of value and extraction. 
Also, I'm going to talk about the importance of considering um, how you um, view and apply AI ethics and AI. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll back up right away. Um, so um, today I'm going to introduce a concept called uh, community-based economies. And I, I, I will discuss how um, artificial intelligence can be used to support that and the importance of considering um, different notions of scale and also um, <clears throat> um, different, va uh, different, value or different definitions of value and extraction. Um, typically, in AI ethics, we think of it, we, and you've seen this throughout this talk, there's, um, there's a preference for top-down approaches, where your point of intervention is in terms of policy, or your point of intervention is in terms of regulation. Um, but there are alternatives. You can begin with workers. You can, begin with, you can begin with people that are directly affected and ask them what they think. In terms of goals, oftentimes, um, these approaches tend to not um, want to disturb um, the, the, the systems that support them. So, for example, you could have you could remove bias, but you don't consider um, the, the the very systems that caused the bias in the first place. From a bottom up approach, we could consider alternatives where we shift production of value and wealth um, to the communities, moving from corporations to communities, moving from um, entities to workers. And um, um, largely, um, the mechanism for debiasing AI focuses on algorithms. It does not focus on constructing new AI algorithms with new people. <clears throat> so, I mean, one, one, one example of this contrast is looking at um, uh, mining, for example, where um, typically a company would go to a forest and they, they would um, do logging and they would um, kind of extract value from nature by preventing it from being able to regenerate. In a similar manner, you can consider social media from a similar, similar perspective. You know, we, we go on Facebook, we enjoy it, but for some reason, you know, there's a lot of conflict. Um, um, it, it'll, it'll raise depression rates among teenagers. There's something being extracted with our use of this kind of platform. Um, and so our thesis is that there's a different way to do this, and that involves artificial intelligence for community-based economies that return value rather than extracting it. Uh, what that means is that um, you know the benefit and majority that you get from using a platform continues to, continues between you and other people that use it. It continues to circulate among you instead of going off to a corporation, for example. Um, as a template um, for um, our platforms for community-based economies, we've got four core um, uh, concepts to keep in mind. One is um, how 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 to keep people playing nice. So, what kind of media um, and preventing um, um, you know, bad, bad behavior. Um, another focus area is how do we consume in a, delib in a, in, in a deliberate way? Um, and that moves to a focus on worker-owned businesses, the notion of bottom-up ethics. And finally, um, you should always keep in mind um, local supply chains, keeping things uh, more regional. So I've, I've described different concepts, including um, extraction, value, and um, the notion of the importance of scale. So now I'm going to talk about our, our, um, our methods and some of our ongoing results. <clears throat> so we, we, we view this work in terms of um, so, um, the so, sociological um, concept of scale, where you have macro, which is individual to individual, you have um, meso, which is like group level or regional, and then you have um, macro, which is um, like almost like society-wide or um, 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 working across continents. Um, for um, our, our macro level work, um, we, uh, we have some initial outcomes, new products, new processes. For a group level or meso level work, we have ongoing experiments. And for macro, we're um, in discussion with different um, organizations. So for our um, macro level work, um, we found that oftentimes um, before doing this bottom up, bottom, or while or in, in the process of doing this bottom up approach, there's some development prior, or, or some development required prior to um, um, developing technology. So in the example on the left, um, if you were to use solar power to do urban farm um, work, you would have to construct harnesses, you would have to transport equipment. Um, definitely a lot of work to be done beforehand. Um, along the technology use spectrum, because we talked about how you can use, de develop AI with people, um, 
um, there's, there's a number of different ways to use AI or even just technology in general. You can use it as in, intended. So in this case, um, we have cookie cutters and uh, um, a, 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 a African symbol, and we're using a, a form, of, a low-tech form of technology to um, kind of spread cultural understanding. And the second case, you can adapt technology for specialized uses. So in this case, we have a laser cutter um, and, and a specialized configuration um, to, to cut jewelry and other, other products to help produce things. And finally, where AI really shines is the innovation portion. And I'll, I'll discuss two ongoing projects that um, are specific to the innovation part of AI for um, our, 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 our approaches. So um, one project is called AI for Clothing. And um, many, many of the folks that we work with are involved in sewing and making clothes. And oftentimes, when you have a pattern that's very popular, but you need to change the sizing, this is a manual process. You have to recalculate all these different numbers, and it's just not very rewarding work. So in this example, it's difficult to see, but you have a sleeve that varies. Uh, you have a sleeve and part of a shirt that varies its um, measurements as people get smaller and larger, and everything typically has to be calculated manually. But there's an alternative approach called parametric clothing design, where um, essentially, you can treat the human body as a parametric system, um, enter new measurements, and generate a new um, piece of clothing without having to manually measure it. So, in this, in this, for this project, we we'll develop. Uh, apologies for the user interface, but it'll get better. Um, but in this project, we have an example of um, part of a um, clothing design, and the user is able to associate parts of the pattern to parts of the, or to different body measurements. And by doing that, we're able to translate um, essentially their understanding of a pattern, its, its association to a, um, the human um, body, and then generate software code that can um, make it a, a, like a parametric um, design. Um, and so that, that's an example of individual to individual uh, bottom up approaches. Um, another example at, at the measure scale, which is more of a group level approach is the notion of routing. So we all know about Uber, we all know about um, you know, uh, traveling between different stop points, but what if we use these routing technologies to also include social and environmental concerns? What if we use these technologies to give the driver a voice as well? Typically, if you work for Uber, you don't get to control where you go, when you go, and how. Um, but we're working with um, a local um, farmer market owner who needs to deliver um, food boxes that people have purchased um, along uh, across Detroit. In this case, this, this example for Ann Arbor, and um, we're we're in, in in development with that. At so I mentioned the three scales: individual, uh, uh, group, and then society or continental. And so the last scale is ma a macro scale, where um, we have se several ongoing projects, partic particularly on the right. We well, we have a, we have a notion of um, transferring uh, materials and products between groups in Detroit and group, groups in um, Ghana, I believe, and um, uh, that are housed in a warehouse in Detroit, and we're able to uh, um, facilitate the circular movement of goods and services. And there's some references as well. And so, um, you know, these, these, these examples and this body of work kind of starts to hint at a template that can be used to create bottom-up, um, kind of like a, a bottom-up ethical approach to AI development. Where, where you collaborate and um, deliberate with people, and you make systems and tools that they want, that they need, through a refinement process. <clears throat> so I guess, you know, to close this talk as a challenge, you know, consider the top-down approaches that you're using now, and consider what a bottom-up approach might look like. So, for example, mortgages, you know, typically, you know, you might want to eliminate bias in a loan. What if you didn't need loans in the first place? A radical idea, but you could use something like land trusts to reduce the new need for loans and have it more of a community approach. Another domain is law, uh, eliminate bias and screening. Well, instead of screening, what if you use restorative justice um, to kind of enable more um, deliberation between people? Um, find a way for health, if, you know, we, um, of course we want to eliminate bias in treatment, but um, do you, um, it's important to consider the point of treatment. Maybe it's worth um, developing approaches to increase or improve preventive care than um, care when it's too late. Um, yeah, so I, I've described a, um, uh, our approach to community-based uh, economies. Um, there's um, 
you know, uh, you, uh, it's important to have different views of value, different views of extraction, and consider how your um, artificial intelligence technologies work at different scales. Um, thank you for your time. I'll take questions. Thanks, David. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Do we have questions for Kwame for his presentation? Questions. We can move on to our break. We're going to have a break, coffee break, until uh, 11 15. There's coffee and refreshments at the back. And we're going to reconvene for our keynote speech. Thank you so much.